Actually, I think Dr. Gray is doing maxillary sinus surgery. I'm just going to start with an overview of nasal anatomy, which I think is underappreciated, the importance of, I mean. And then I'll talk a little bit about sphenoethmoidectomy in about 10 minutes or so. So, you know, I'm going to go over some very basic things because someone once taught me if you do the small things well, the big things just end up going well. And I really uh, think that's some good sage advice. So my technique for inferior turbinate out fracture, and as I mentioned, and many others have, we begin sinus surgery or any nasal surgery by outfracturing both inferior turbinates. I use a Boise elevator. It's a little heavier. I think you're all familiar with it. The only tip I have for outfracturing is make sure you can see the tip of your instrument. So I've seen some people put the scope down, put two hands on the Boise and really try to ream it over. I don't think you need to do that. It's a heavy instrument. I kind of follow it down all the way posteriorly and I outfracture a little bit up front and then I go right to the back. Now, I'm not going to gain a lot by outfracturing way back here, but what it allows me to do is uh, appreciate the anatomy of the tip of my instrument to the middle turbinate. Because if, I can, if I'm looking out here, I may inadvertently grab the middle turbinate and outfracture that as well. So you want to make sure you see the middle meatus. You're going to forcibly outfracture that inferior turbinate. And by keeping the free edge of your uh, Boise above the attachment point, you actually won't skive into it and cause that bleeding that sometimes does end up happening. So on this side, we've already done the out fracture of the inferior turbinate. You see we have a little spur here, and here's my middle turbinate. Maybe what we'll do is I'll first just go through the, uh, the CT anatomy. As several highlighted, we always want to start with this. So if you're seeing my uh, CT scan view, I'm just going to focus on that for a minute. Here's our uh, septal spur that we talked about. If we start from front to back, you're starting to see the, uh, the nasal bones way out here. That's a piriform aperture that we're now kind of seeing uh, our, my instrument go into. We're starting to see that uncinate process and its relationship to the middle turbinate and the infundibulum that Dr. Gray talked about. You can see there's a little ethmoid bulla right there and a little haller cell potentially, or the starting of one right there. Um, so as we continue to go back, we talked about how you want to look for those anterior ethmoid arteries. I commented on the last cut of the globe, which is right about here, confluence of the medial rectus and the uh, superior oblique. So there's your ethmoid arteries on both sides. They look like they're at the level of the skull base, so they should not be in my field. You're starting to see now also the superior turbinate right here. And again, that sphenoid ostium is going to be medial to the superior turbinate. Uh, I went through the, past the frontals here. I'll just back up, and Dr. Adapa is going to talk about that. Uh, but if I come to the outside for a second, we'll show you some of the frontal cells that we see here. I'll, I'll put it back in. Let me just take a moment to show also the sphenoid anatomy, because that's what I'm focusing on for this dissection. You can see we have a few posterior ethmoid cells. And as we go to the back, there is kind of a cruciate sphenoid sign that I mentioned. Right about, let me just get under here, right there. See how there's like, a, in this case, not maybe a full cruciate, but a T sign in the sphenoid? That should tip us off that we've got a left and right sphenoid and then a big O nodi cell right there. You can also see the vidian uh, canal and the nerve in it here, the medial and inferior uh, foramina, and then also superolateral in this well uh, pneumatized lateral sphenoid recess, we have that foramen rotundum. So look how obviously demarcated those vidian canals are. On this view, you can also see the vomer, uh, the midline part of the septum, and the pterygoid plates that I pointed out uh, that you can see the medial and lateral inferiorly. Kind of like that case uh, that I showed upstairs, in this Onodi cell, we would expect to see the optic nerve and the carotid artery below it. Uh, and that's the OCR, that pneumatized space that's being pointed out there be between the optic nerve superiorly and the carotid inferiorly. So like the case I showed, this is very similar, and you are at risk for an optic nerve injury and indeed a carotid artery injury if we don't recognize it. So let me just clean my scope and show you that one piece of anatomy that I think is super important for accessing the sphenoid because it shows us best the... Um, superior turbinate and middle turbinate relationship. So here is the middle turbinate. And if you just lateralize it gently, you'll see this cleft right here. So superior turbinate, sphenoid face, and this very conserved cleft. And you can see above it, you can't differentiate superior turbinate and middle turbinate because they're part of the same bone or lamella. So in this space is where we want to come when we go through the basal lamella. Appreciate if I come a little bit more lateral to where my 
uh, pro, my uh, free, uh, freer elevator is, I'm going to enter the posterior ethmoid cells and I won't be able to see the superior turbinate. If I can landmark this to come through here at the turn of the basal lamella, I should enter in front of the superior turbinate, thereby making it easier for me to kind of recognize it. Now, it's not kind of cheating to go transnasally. You can do that in every case if it helps you to find this phenoid os, to find this cleft, and so on. Uh, and there's a variety of ways to get to this phenoid, right? This transnasal view, the transethmoid view, and historically, transeptal and even transpalatal. So with that said, let's start our dissection here. You guys need me to pause, right? Are we okay? Right? Okay. So if I medialize the turbinate, and you know, small things, uh, as I mentioned before, are important. So after inferior, uh, fracturing the inferior turbinate, I like to medialize the middle turbinate. Because this is the view and this is my workspace, right? I'm accentuating the matchbox we talked about. So maxillary line here, that's the junction of the in, uh, the insertion of the uncinate process, the anterior limit, to the ascending process of the maxilla. In an anterograde uncinectomy, we incise right here. I think many people don't do that anymore. I don't really either. Here's the free edge of the uncinate process. That space that's between it and the face of bulla right here is the hiatus semilunaris. So we want to make sure that we medialize and kind of uh, anteroflex that uncinate when we're taking it down. Down here, we see the basal lamella. And look at the attachment of the middle turbinate right here. That's a really important landmark that you want to see because as you're making your entrostomy and we see an accessory os right here. Why is it accessory? Because as Dr. Gray uh, taught us, the natural os is way here, anterior in the infundibulum. So you want to note this uh, lateral attachment of the middle turbinate. One, because you're going to get bleeding coming from that area if you get too close to the attachment. And two, that's going to help demarcate the strut we leave so that when we take down the basal lamella, one, we don't get into that bleeding, and two, though, we don't destabilize the middle turbinate too much. You've probably read about relaxing incisions. That's when you kind of follow the medial aspect here, uh, the lateral aspect of the middle turbinate, and you just kind of uh, poke through the basal lamella right here. That's thought to help you then reflect the middle turbinate medially. So I do all of this that I just showed you. I examine it, I medialize the middle turbinate, I crunch any little intralamellar cells, I may do that little relaxing poke, and then I'll inject and put my pledgets in here. And then if you can calibrate your system, your navigation, that's great too. When you come back after decongestion, it looks like a different patient. You've got the middle turbinate well opposed to the septum, inferior turbinate's out, and it'll give you a really confident feeling that you can see all of your anatomy. So I'm gonna grab the micro debrider. Uh, do we have that double ball probe? Here it is, thank you. So Dr. Gray is going to do the uh, maxillary entrostomy, so I don't wanna do too much here. But I totally agree that you don't want to disturb anything lateral to this uncinate. And you can see it kind of wiggling here, right? Its fixed attachment is here. It's got a free edge posteriorly. So I also like to stay very low. If you divide the maxillary line into thirds, the, uncinate, the uh, maxillary entrostomy is going to be here in the lower aspect where the middle third and the lower third kind of come together. So I'm expecting it to find it here. But I'm just going to put the ball, the big ball we always use too, around the uncinate and just kind of palpate a little bit. And even without doing any trauma, I can look around the corner a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of pull this a little bit forward. And I would do the same going all the way up. I don't want to teach you anything wrong, so I'm going to let Stacy do the, uh, the honors of that. It's also a reasonable move to kind of fall into this accessory osteum and stretch that out if you want a little bit. So I'm going to leave that there and I'll grab the shaver and I'll keep moving. You're going to keep me on time here if I, uh... all right. So I made the point that when you're going to attack your uh, bulla, you're going to medialize that middle turbinate and appreciate that medial most aspect of the bulla. I commented that you can use a shaver. Can you hit the IPC button there for me? Uh, one quick second. All right. So. Uncinate, there's my bulla ethmoidalis. I can open up my curette, uh, my microdebrider like this, and I can just kind of curette it. Movements here are parallel to orbit, engaging the medial most aspect of the bulla. Then I, you can shave down a little bit, and as I commented upon, the lateral aspect of the bulla is the orbit. So once you get down a little bit of this mucosa, you can even look in there and see where the orbit is just lateral to us there. So you may continue and kind of take down as much of the bulla I'm going to leave the cap and some of the bulla uh, in situ and undisturbed here because we are going to do a frontal dissection afterwards. 
And one good uh, kind of wisdom on using the shaver is you want to almost be able to see the aperture at every moment, right? I don't want to have this view and using a shaver. It's a powered instrument. There's critical structures nearby. So I actually want to be able to see much of the aperture. And notice once you take that bullet down, you can see the lamina, which should be in that lateral most aspect. A little bit of a glare on the uh, scope, but so there's the orbit there. Now, as I mentioned, I don't spend a lot of time on the max up front. I don't skeletonize the orbit up here. The uh, trajectory of the medial wall, the orbit is from uh, anterior lateral to posterior medial. So I make the point that the orbit and skull base are going to find me once I get into the posterior most ethmoid, ethmoid cells. So the next step, I'm going to go through my basal lamella. We use the, so usually I would open the maxillary more than this, obviously, but the height of the maxillary sinus is going to be my play to get into that little cleft that I talked about. So instead of going straight through the basal lamella, I'm going to open my microbial like a curette and try to go through just one little layer right at the turn. Boom. Once you do that, you can back up a little bit and try to find that superior turbinate, which is what I'm looking for. And when you see it, you have to kind of take a moment to actually look for it and make sure that you're in the right spot. So I feel like I probably have to come even more anterior here. We've got some thick bone here in the basal of my life. I think I'm just about to go through it right here. Okay, so I'm through it there. Now, one thing here is, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the septum or if that's a superior turbinate. So you do have to take a minute just to kind of clarify that for yourself. And right there, you're starting to see the superior turbinate. So you see, if I would have gone here, I might have tagged it with a shaver and it might have bled. But by coming just at the actual kind of genuine turn of the ground or basal lamella, it lets me see now septum and superior turbinate. And this phenoid I know now, as we mentioned, is medial to the superior turbinate right there. So that's the kind of picture that you're looking for. Not too medial, right at the turn of the basal lamella to the more uh, coronal planed aspect of it. You find your superior turbinate, and now that I've seen it, I can kind of delineate a little bit more of the posterior ethmoid cells. You heard this morning, by definition, if I've gone through this basal lamella, I'm in the posterior ethmoid cells. There's a variety of little partitions here. I do a little bit of this now just to give myself some wiggle room, right? So I have some space to work. And then early on, I do like to go after this sphenoid sinus if indeed I'm doing a total sphenoethmoidectomy. If I'm not, I'll delineate superior turbinate, and then I won't go into the sphenoethmoid recess. I don't want to do anything iatrogenic, right? So now I'll stay totally lateral to the uh, superior turbinate. And you can see where that skull base is kind of sloping down posteriorly. You might say, well, how do you know this is not the anterior ethmoid artery? I know because I'm low and because I used the nav and I looked at my images. We said anterior ethmoid artery is in the level of the skull base. I'm not going to worry about it too much, in other words. So I don't want to take out too much of that bowler cap. I'll leave the rest of it alone. We would take some time to kind of take down all of these partitions and, and get all the way back. And then you'll also notice that I can see the lower half of the superior turbinate. Nitta made a really good point yesterday that when you go through the basal lamella, if I opened it up here, I'd say, oh, here's a superior turbinate, and I might think that I have a lot of room. By coming low down here, preserving strut, using the height of the maxillary sinus, and ensuring you see the lower part of the superior turbinate with a big basal lamella opening, you'll be able to appreciate the full height of the ethmoid sinus and find the skull base, as opposed to entering here, where even a few small moves might put you very close to skull base. So we always start by resecting the lower third. Uh, again, in polyps, we would take more of the superior turbinate. I'm just going to make some more wiggle room here. If I don't feel like I have enough play, I can come back and take down a little bit more of this bulla. I can delineate and take down even lower my uh, basal lamella opening, although I like to landmark the inferior most aspect once and then forget about it. There's a little cell you can see in the navigation of the superior turbinate, so a concha of both superior turbinates here, or an interlamellar cell. And then we mentioned that there's an onodi cell in play here, right? So look at my sagittal view here. You might think that's going to be my sphenoid sinus, and I just kind of fell into it here. That's actually the onodi cell, and it's my sagittal view that's telling me that. So let me just open this up a little bit. You can appreciate that, and then we'll open up the sphenoid, and we'll get Dr. Gray in here. 
So sometimes you see these little uh, wisps of mucosa because I've only taken out the bone. In this case, I try to come away from any critical structures, spin the wheel a couple times, and just kind of let it open up on its own. Okay, so you might think, wow, we're in this phenoid sinus, and maybe we are. We'll double check here in a second, but I, I suspect perhaps not. There's that same view on the video, right? Optic nerve, supralateral, OCR, and the carotid below. And so that actually is now the roof of the sphenoid sinus or the planoid sphenoidale. You can see I'm touching it there. When you have an onodi this big, uh, you can find the natural os here, open it up, and you can take out this floor of the onodi cell, which as a nav is showing, is the roof of the sphenoid, but not the uh, uh, planum sphenoidale, right? It's a little partition in between. So in addition to opening medial lateral like we've been talking about, you actually can take out that whole floor uh, if you want to make a really big opening. So you can see, I can already see that uh, sphenoid os here. We pointed to the height of the maxillary sinus as a basal lamella opening. That's almost also the line I pursue to find the sphenoid ostium. Uh, the other landmark that we didn't talk about is in the transethmoid view, my key landmark is superior turbinate height of max. If I'm doing the transnasal view, we go one and a half centimeters up from coena, okay? So if I did flip the middle turbinate and we went this way, one and a half centimeters up from the coena is where I would expect to see the os, and that's roughly where it is. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of be heavy-handed about this. I'm just going to punch into this. Do we have a mushroom punch? Well, if you have one, I'll take it. Mushroom? Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, you see me f kind of fluidly going between the uh, transethmoid and transnasal view. You don't want to destabilize the middle turbinate too much. So if you take a look transnasally, you can find the sphenoid open a bit. Then I would consider the rest of my procedure done through the ethmoid. A few keys on using the, the mushroom punch. I like to go in uh, closed and then just open it a little bit so you can see what you're biting. And you can see it's hard to use a mushroom punch in the setting of an onodi because the plane of this partition is going in the same dimension as my instrument. It's a lot easier to bite when I'm perpendicular to the face. Right. We talked about the posterior septal artery coming off of this phenopal. That would be somewhere in this area. So if I did want to open this lower, I might take a bite or two but then I would reflect that mucosa down with a caudal or freer elevator to uh, preserve the artery and open things wider. Um, when I'm operating with residents and fellows, I also often say, well, tell me when you think you're done. Like, am I done now? It's getting back to that idea. It depends on the goals of my surgery. If this is not polyps, maybe that's big enough, right? That should be a big enough opening. Looking in here, you can see the pituitary or the cellar face. That's a bone over where the pituitary lives. Again, that partition likely going to the carotid canal on the left. So maybe I'll stop there for this phenoidotomy. You, again, we can take this all the way over to the orbit and indeed take down this entire superior plane uh, if we wanted to. So why don't I also just uh, show a little bit that septoplasty. I think you want me to do that, right? Or you want me to tap? I think so. Stop. Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we're gonna tag in and we have Dr. Gray right behind me.